Hello there, my inner sphere denizens, and welcome to more Battletech lore. Today's episode is gonna be dedicated to arguably the pioneers of battle armor design in the inner sphere. If you've listened to any of my Battletech audiobooks, you are probably familiar with the Grey Death Legion, the mercenary group led by Grayson Carlyle. What you may or may not know, however, is that this guy and his people were among the first in the Inner Sphere to design and use battle armor. So today I thought we could describe their main designs. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Great Death Standard massed at 1 full ton and 600,000 sea bills. The standard was developed by the technicians of the Grey Death Legion after the new Avalon Institute of Science sent them prototype battle armor suits, the progenitors of what would eventually become the Inner Sphere standard. Using what was learned from the testing, the Legion decided to remove the suit's jump ability and make room for dedicated anti-infantry firepower, superior sensors, and reinforced Mimer bundles to improve ground speed. While they did lose the ability to leap over obstacles, the changes made the suit easier to maintain and cheaper to build than the Inner Sphere standard. The new armor, as well as the Great Death Scout suit, which we're gonna get to in a minute, debuted during the clan invasion against the clan Jade Falcon for control of the world of Pandora. The Great Death standard played a decisive role in the Great Death Legion's victory over the Falcons. After that, the Legion continued building a limited number of the standard suits, mostly to replenish their own losses, but also to sell them to other mercenary commands. Following its creation, the Legion also sold limited numbers of the Great Death Standard to the Lyran Alliance. The Great Death Legion unfortunately was effectively destroyed in battle on Hesperus II in 3065, one of the casualties of the Felcom Civil War, but the suits they created would live on. The surviving members of the Legion support staff created Grey Death Technologies, and with the aid of the Defiance Industries, established a dedicated factory on Glengarry to continue production. As the only dedicated battle armor manufacturer in the realm at that time, Grey Death Technologies continued selling the standard suits to the Lyran Alliance and other mercenary groups. Sadly, disaster struck again during the Jihad, when the Word of Blake attacked Glengarry in 3073 and sacked the factory. The destruction was not complete, however, and the survivors were able to restart production on a new variant of the Great Death Standard. When Presenter Berif attacked yet again one year later, he was more thorough, and destroyed the factory and rendered the GDT incapable of building any more battlesuits. By that point, Grey Death Technology was bought up by Defiance Industries, which decided to move manufacturing of the Grey Death Standard to Ferrillo and put a hold on any new designs. Production of the Grey Death Standard resumed in late 3080, although the sale of the latter was restricted to the Lyran Alliance and Defiance Industries' own security. Equipment-wise, this battle armor retains the modular weapon mount of the Inner Sphere Standard in the right arm allowing it to carry either a single tube SRM launcher with four reloads, a flamer, a small laser, or a machine gun. Beginning in 3069, the mount could also accept a light recoilless rifle. On the left arm is an anti-personnel weapon mount dealing with conventional infantry. The left arm also has a battle claw, allowing it to make anti-mech attacks or be transported into battle via Omnimech handholds. The Great Death Standard carries 450 kilos of standard armor, or, for the Americans out there, a thousand pounds. This is enough to survive a full burst from an Inner Sphere large pulse laser and keep the trooper alive. It has improved sensors for detecting hidden opponents, including mimicking the function of a portable radar sensor. It can also maintain an impressive top speed of 32.4 kilometers an hour. The second of the major Grey Death variants is the Grey Death Scout, massing a little less at 750 kilos and a cost of 275,000 sea bills. The Grey Death Scout is a rather radical take on battle armor in general, almost taking the battle out of the battle armor. When the new Avalon Institute of Science sent prototypes of the Inner Sphere standard to the Grey Death Legion, 
the mercenaries were duly impressed by many of its features. However, there was also some criticism, and they sent a long list of improvements back to the NAAS while the Legion technicians went about to their own tinkering. By late 3051, the Legion had created two distinct suits of the original prototype, the Grey Depth Standard, which we just mentioned, and the lighter Scout Armor suit. By stripping away more than half of the armor and the integrated weapons, the technicians were able to improve the scout's jumping and sensor capabilities, creating a design suitable for deep reconnaissance. The scout armor made its debut in 3052, fighting alongside the Grade of Standard to defeat the Jade Falcons on Pandora. The production of the scout suits halted in 3074 after the destruction of the Grade of Technologies by Word of Blake. The remnants of the company were then absorbed by Defiance Industries, which would transfer production of the Scouts as well to Ferrillo. Although the Grey Dev Scout armor did not have integral weapons, its armored gloves allowed the soldiers to wield standard weapons and perform other functions as normal too. While this did not allow for very much damage against hardened targets, a Scout squad can be a serious threat to unarmored infantry. The armored gloves, in combination with the suit's strength enhancements, allows the trooper to ride on omni-mech handholds or perform anti-mech attacks. That the trooper's natural dexterity is otherwise unaffected by the suit is an added bonus for placing satchel charges in exposed mech joints. The intelligence gathering capabilities of this thing are further enhanced with the inclusion of a long-range communication system and a light active probe. The sensors can mimic the capabilities of a portable radar and infrared remote sensor too. This suit was also the first one to incorporate a jump booster, which pushed the maximum jumping distance to 120 meters. Unfortunately, although expected, it is only protected by 200 kilos of armor, or 440 pounds. And just one blast out of a medium laser can obliterate both the armor and the pilot. In 3076, Fox Infantry Systems rebuilt the Grey Death Legion Scout armor used by the so-called Will-O-Wisps, a group of female gladiators competing on the Magistracy of Canopus planet called Hardcore. Yes, there was a planet called Hardcore. The standard armor was replaced by 240 kilos of improved stealth armor, which while it does provide the same level of protection, it makes them almost impossible to hit. The suit was also redesigned using new composite joint systems to make them more flexible than the original. Finally, the active probes were removed and replaced by a clan micropulse laser. The Grey Death Infiltrator suit is the next one on the list, massing at one full ton. It was manufactured on Ferrillo by Defiance Industries, and it was the successor of the Infiltrator Mark I. And while it was intended to fulfill a range of battlefield roles, it best performed as a scout or skirmisher. Nicknamed the Quoka, the Grey Death Infiltrator was configured to be highly mobile and incorporated a parafoil to allow it to make precise aerial drops. It was capable of making swarm and leg attacks as well as being able to travel by mechanized transport. Each of the suits had a basic manipulator on each arm and more than a third of a ton of basic stealth armor for protection. For weapons, each infiltrator had a David Light Gauss rifle with 15 rounds of ammo in the right arm. The left arm of each suit was fitted with a modular weapon mount, capable of mounting a Fire Drake support needler with 30 rounds of ammo, a light tag system with 60 rounds of ammo, a package of improved sensors, a remote sensor dispenser, or a mine dispenser with two mines. The last of today's Grey Death designs is the so-called Grey Death Strike, massing at one full ton. This original version of the Strike suit was unique, for being a hybrid of the Inner Sphere and Clan technology. The suit removing the improved sensors and modular weapon mount of the Grey Death Standard, and in their place are a Clan Spec detachable advanced SRM-3 launcher with three shots mounted on the suit's body, and a light tag system in the left arm that can spot for artillery. Both the arms ended in battle claws and the AP mount was retained, as it were its movement capabilities and armor, although the missile launcher had to be jettisoned before any anti-mech attacks could be made. 
The reliance on clan technology prevented the suit from reaching mass production, as not even the Diamond Sharks were willing to sell enough components to justify such a move. Although Defiance Industries eventually went with a redesigned production model using Inner Sphere technology, it was rumored that they kept the prototypes for their own security. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about this particular brand of battle armor from the ever-pioneering Grey Death Legion. Rest in peace, Grace and Carlisle. It is interesting to see that it took the interest and innovation of a mercenary company, of all things, to put a type of combat unit on the map before any of the great houses made good designs of their own. What about you, though? Did you know about any of these Grey Death Battle Armor variants? Which one did you find the most interesting? As always, I do look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode or found it informative, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and have a healthy day. This is GDN signing out.